Well, as Kim earlier said, this is a uh, new series of messages about what happens to a human being when they actually reconnect with their creator and start to live in accordance with what the creator's original purpose was for our life. We start to live the way the creator designed us. Uh, it inevitably makes tremendous transformation in us, and it's transformation from the inside out. It's authentic. It's, it's not something that we're doing just out of fear or out of desire to work some kind of a bargain uh, to get into heaven or whatever that thought might be, but it's something that, that has a deep, lasting, transforming power in our lives. There's a verse or a couple verses that I want to be the overarching verses for this series. From the uh, New Testament book of Colossians, the Apostle Paul writing to followers of Christ living in a Greek city of Colossae, speaking of Christ, it says, For by him were all things created, which are in heaven and which are in earth, things visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. This is talking about angelic civilizations. All things were created by him and all things, what does it say? for him. This is really important. It's one of those verses It's easy to kind of just read it and skip over this part and not really contemplate the deeper meaning. That means that absolutely you exist. I exist because you were made. I was made for Christ. I'm never totally human. I'm never fully alive until I enter into this kind of a relationship with my creator that he created me for. He's known you. He's known me by name since before we existed, made by Christ and for him, Christ existed before all things and in union with him, all things, what does it say? Have their proper place. Everything finds order. You and me, we find our proper place. Everything inside of us finds its proper place when we're aligned with him, with his will. It's the way that he designed us. Now, we're also going to do in this series, or attempt to do something else. Each of us has a story, an interesting spiritual story. And we might be at various parts in the journey, but uh, typical spiritual journeys look something like this illustration. My life before Christ, uh, I can certainly identify with that. That was the first 23 years of my life. How I came to Christ, for me, it was in 1973 at age 23. And then my life since trusting Christ. Now, here's why I want you to kind of absorb this. What I am asking each of you to do, now certainly you don't have to do this, but I sure hope you will. I want you in this six message series to get along with God and to think and to contemplate and write your story. Use those three demarcations. What was my life like before Christ? Who was I? What was I like? How did I come to Christ? How did I come to put my trust in him and become his follower? And then what has my life been like since I put my trust in Christ and became his follower? Now, to start us off this morning, we have an example from one of our own folks. Um, just going to give you a first name. Name is Katie. And here's her story. What was my, like, uh, my life like before I came to know Christ? She says, I was unmotivated, self-centered, insecure, and numb. I had no real long-term goals or passions. I was deeply concerned with what would affect myself and my family, but was unsympathetic to the struggles of many around me. I found my value in the praise of others. I was perfectly content to stay distracted in various ways. I did this to avoid reflection. Reflection would mean that I would have to face unwanted feelings, conflicts, and the fact that I knew nothing for certain about my purpose in life. Second phase, how I came to Christ. I tried to be the director of my life and was failing miserably. I began searching and found overwhelming evidence. However, I didn't have an accurate picture of God. My doubts were pro providing to be, excuse me, my doubts were proving to be too strong, and I imagined that God was frustrated with me. God patiently revealed his character to me through the Bible, the experiences, and people. Finally, I received an encourage I received encouragement in the form of these words. You're on your way to hearing a well done, good and faithful servant. These words shattered me. I realized he had not been frustrated, but proud of me for searching. His love was too much to comprehend. My misconceptions of God crumbled. I completely trusted him and wanted to follow him all my life. 
Third phase, how my life has been different since. I'm a work in progress, but my capacities to love, serve, and forgive are growing. I feel known. I'm hopeful and secure and valued. I work diligently for God and not for the accolades of others. I'm a lover of studying and learning, and I want to know anything and everything that God wants me to know. My greatest joy and privilege is to point others back to him. I'm humbled because I realize anything good in me is because of God's mercy and his grace. Though I fall short often, I continually pray, and he searches me and replaces my will with his, my desires with his desires, and my plans for his plans. So here's an example of what I'm actually asking each of you to do. Call it a homework assignment. You have six weeks to do it. If you do this, here's what I promise you. It'll be tremendously valuable to you, the experience. And it will equip you to have a story, your story, which is a very powerful thing to be ready to share with someone else. Maybe there's people in your life and you know what a difference Christ is making in your life. Now that you're reconnected to your creator and you know who you are and why you're here and how life was meant to be and why it's the way it is and where it's going and, and you want someone else to reconnect with their creator like you have. And so telling your story, sharing your story is a very humble, non-threatening way to do this. And so I hope you will actually take this, uh, this experiential journey together that we'll all do this. And what we want to do from week to week is read various stories. We're going we're gonna to post them uh, outside on the wall out there. But then we also want to take time like this and uh, share at least one each week. So today we're going to turn a corner and we're going to ask a question. And this is a very personal message. Uh, in fact, i got to be honest with you. If I can stay glued together through this whole series, it'll be quite a task. Uh, because here's the God's honest truth. Anything, anything of any value that I have experienced in my life, anything that is good in my life, in me, anything that I now love and care about, it is all because of Christ's involvement in my life since age 23. I'm telling you, I was as unhealthy a person as you could ever have met. And that's what this message is about. I wonder if there was ever a time in your life, maybe now you can look back and you can, you can look at your life honestly now, it's not too threatening, and you look back and you can see, man, there was a time, there was a time in my life when I was so, I was so unhealthy. You can see it now. And it's not too threatening. You can acknowledge it. I wonder how many of us can identify with that. You can look back and you can see, man, I... I was a real mess. I certainly can. Second question. I wonder if some of you, you can look back to a time in your life where you became aware that you were unhealthy or at least you were pretty suspicious that there was some problems. But every time you thought about it, you tried to block it out of your mind. You tried to blame it on others or blame it on things or, or just kind of do something to distract yourself because you just didn't want to deal with it. You knew that dealing with it was going to take you into some uncomfortable areas and you just kind of blocked it out and you hoped that it would just kind of go away, take care of itself. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but I also went through that. And then the third category, third question. I wonder if some of you can identify with the experience that finally you were so unhealthy, it was impossible to ignore it. You couldn't ignore it anymore because people all around you were kind of colluding. It was kind of this consensus that you are an unhealthy person. People were bailing on you. Relationships were crumbling. People didn't want to be around you. They were avoiding you. It seemed like you were the source of conflict all the time. And people were just telling you, you are unhealthy. You've got to deal with this. You were unhealthy. You knew it. And now people all around you were telling you on such a regular basis, you finally came to the place it was impossible to run from it anymore. It was impossible to ignore it. It was impossible to blame it on someone else or something else. You finally had to own it. And I know that experience too. So let those questions, let them kind of work around in your mind, in your heart, take them very personal because God wants to do something very powerful in this series of messages, and in this message today, 
He wants to take some of us that are very unhealthy and put us on the path to restoration. So we're going to look at a guy today that is um, the perfect symbol of being unhealthy. If you don't mind turning this Bible, that are near you on the chair to the Gospel of Mark, or if you have your own Bible, turn to the Gospel of Mark chapter 1, and that will be page 1132, those Bibles that are near you on the chairs, and we're going to read chapter 1, verse 40 through 45, just a few short verses. And it's a particular episode in the life of Jesus where he uh, connects with a certain very, very unhealthy man. So again, that's page 1132 in his Bibles near you. It's uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 40 through 45. It starts. Now a, and what is the word? A leper. Someone with leprosy. Now a leper came to him. And fell to his knees. Notice the desperation and the humility. Asking for help. If you're willing, you can make me clean, he said. Moved with compassion, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be clean. The leprosy left him at once, and he was clean. Immediately, Jesus sent the man away with a very strong warning. He told him, see that you do not say anything to anyone, but go, show yourself to a priest, and bring the offering that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. The book of Leviticus in the Old Testament, chapter 13, the entire 13th chapter is dedicated to a process that God gave for Israelite priests to determine if someone was leprous, and if they were, how to quarantine them, and then how to restore them in the case where they might somehow uh, be healed from this disease. So that's kind of what Jesus is referring to when he says, go show yourself to the priest. Look what the man actually does, verse 45. But as the man went out, he began to announce it publicly and spread the story widely so that Jesus was no longer able to enter any town openly, but stayed outside in remote places. Still they kept coming to him from everywhere. So it's a real simple story until you put yourself in this guy's skin. I mean, leprosy. To just remind ourselves a little bit about physical leprosy, here's a couple pictures of what it does to you. It attacks the nerves, it attacks the muscles, um, it destroys your face, your nose generally usually collapses, you generally go blind, your vocal cords are affected, and, and usually ends in death. Um, pretty highly contagious. Uh, spread by vapor, you know, like if a leper were to sneeze on you, that would be the worst possible thing that could happen. And so that's just to remind us. Now, you might be thinking that leprosy is something that no longer exists. In fact, there's about 250,000 cases of leprosy worldwide. You might also think that, but that's not here. That's just in those third world nations. Well, there's about 6,500 cases of leprosy in the United States right now. Right now. There's 175 new cases of leprosy in the United States every year. So... Even though it's rare, it does still exist. Now, 95% of us, for whatever reason, we are immune to leprosy, whether we would know it or not. But we have no way of knowing that. The other thing that's curious about leprosy is this. When leprosy infects someone... Its incubation period is completely unknown. In other words, you might have symptoms within a week, a month, two years, five years. You could go 20 years carrying it and not knowing it, and then suddenly, suddenly, the symptoms become physically evident. I'm just curious, how many in here have ever seen an armadillo? I, I, I know this seems like a terrible drift, but how, how, many, how many have ever seen an armadillo? Okay, all right, next question is much more serious. How many have ever touched an armadillo? Oh, man. Sorry for you. The only animal that can give you leprosy is an armadillo. But 95% of us are immune to leprosy in any case. But it has a long incubation. So, <laughs> now, you know, obviously you think, well, what, what does leprosy have to do with being unhealthy? Well, obviously, physically, you can't get much you know, more unhealthy than having leprosy. And let me tell you a little bit about the life of the leper. The leper in biblical days, 
based on Leviticus 13 in the Old Testament, had to tear their clothes, put a cloth you know, over their mouth, and live in isolation, essentially. And when they would see somebody on the road, anybody approaching them, they would have to yell out, unclean, unclean. They identified themselves as unclean. They couldn't have any association with any other Israelite. They were not welcome in the temple community of worship. They lived in utter isolation. The only people that they could safely get around are other lepers. It was a lonely, lonely, heartbreaking existence. Uh, they literally could not have any meaningful, loving relationships. Now, we don't know about this guy's past. We don't, we don't know what, he might have been a handsome fella. He might have been, you know, economically successful. He may have had a family and friends and a good life. And then all of a sudden, one day, one day, those bumps started showing up and he finally had to lose everything. One of, the, one of the number one, listen to me carefully, some of you, some of you, God so means this for some of you here lovingly. Jesus touched this guy with compassion. Some of you, you're losing things, things that matter to you a lot. You're losing them. And maybe you've glossed over it. Maybe you say, hey, man, that's life. It just kind of happens to everybody. But if you look, there's a pattern forming where things that are important, things that are precious to you, you're, you're losing them. And I'm not saying all the time, but sometimes that's a sign that there's real un, unhealth in you. There's real dis-ease. There's something going on. There's a big problem. Now, we don't know how this guy got the disease. We do know that he's unlikely to have touched an armadillo since, you know, there's no armadillos to my knowledge in Israel. So he more than likely received this disease from someone else who may have not known that they had it. And I think that a lot of us that find ourselves in that, that state of life where we're unhealthy and we know it, and we don't like it, we're lonely, we can't sustain relationships, we're aching inside because we feel so isolated, so different, so uninvited, so disconnected. Maybe... Maybe we are victims. We, we, we didn't do anything to deserve it. There's no indication this man did anything to deserve it. In fact, that was one of the horrible beliefs in this day, that if you were a leper, that you were, deli- you were cursed of God. God was angry at you. Jesus, who is God, proved that was nonsense. When everybody was running away from this guy, Jesus is stretching out toward him, grabs him, and lets the rush of Jesus' own life flow into this man, driving out the disease. You see, we can contaminate each other because we're all unhealthy. But Jesus is so full of health. He is the standard of health. He can touch us and he pushes out of us the dis-ease and we partake of his health. But we don't know how this guy got it. But I can tell you that a lot of us that are unhealthy... We didn't deserve it. We didn't, we didn't choose it. We didn't do it to ourselves. There's a movie that uh, I recently watched, and it's called The Glass Castle. Just curious. Anybody seen it? In, in my opinion, as a kind of an avid movie guy, uh, it is a brilliant movie. It is not one of these things, after you watch it, you're going to go bubbly, cheerfully away from it, okay? It is brilliantly acted. Woody Harrelson, Naomi Watts, Brie Larson. Uh, it is a true story based on the mem- memoirs of Jeanette Walls, a well-known journalist, and it's about her life. And it's this, this dysfunctional mixture of, of wonderful times and terrifying, horrifying times that her dad and her mom brought about or brought upon those kids. Now, I'm not much of the one for playing the victim game, okay? But the truth of the matter is this. Extremely dysfunctional families, unhealthy families, tend to take their unhealthiness and put it upon the children. Uh, I I grew up in probably one of the most dysfunctional, uh, unhealthy families, if you could even call it that. I was bounced back and forth that I've ever seen. Now, I've met people since then who are even much, much worse. And I'm not trying to make excuses for myself, but as I got some age behind me, I could look back and I could see that a lot of the things that had made me so unhealthy, I caught it, man. It was was a family full of leprosy, emotional, mental, spiritual leprosy. And and then I, I got a good dose of it and took it to an extreme. And maybe some of you too. And the reason this is important for you to hear 
is because this man could have believed the garbage that his society was telling him. You're cursed of God, man. You deserve this. You did something to get this. And sometimes we, when we're in that state where we know we're unhealthy, once we give it up and we can't ignore it anymore, we start feeling so ashamed of ourselves. We feel so guilty. We, we literally loathe ourselves. We, we want to survive, and yet there's a part of us that, that almost doesn't want to at times. And I'm not saying that we should blame our condition on anybody or anything, but reality is reality. Sometimes we get mental, emotional, spiritual leprosy because we grew up in a family or a situation loaded with unhealth and dysfunction. I don't know what this guy's case was, but I do know that Jesus never treats this guy in any way, shape, or form as though he was responsible for his condition. So let's look at it from our standpoint of where we started. Life up to the point of meeting Jesus is what we've covered so far. It was a lonely, dark, hopeless existence. He couldn't ignore how unhealthy he was. He didn't want to be disconnected from people, disconnected from God, he thought. But he couldn't really do anything about it. He didn't even know where to start because there was no solution for leprosy in those days. His feelings, the feelings that we have when we're in that state where we're, we know we're unhealthy, We can't ignore it anymore, but we don't know what to do about it. Kind of feels like what Job described in the ancient book of Job. It says, if only my anguish could be weighed and all my misery be placed on the scales, it would surely outweigh the sand of the seas. I'll bet you there's more than one person here this morning that is exactly what you have felt very recently. You felt like there's not another person on this planet that understands how bad it feels right now to be me. How much misery I feel inside this moment, this day, this week. And if it could be weighed, it would be like the sand of the sea. There's another verse I'd like to share with you. And this gives a little bit of a hope. In the book of Isaiah chapter 57, 15, it says, For this is what the high and exalted one says. And by the way, this is just Jesus in the Old Testament. This is what the high and exalted one says. The one who rules forever, whose name is holy I dwell in an exalted and holy place, but also with the who? Discouraged and the who? Humili- These lepers were utterly humiliated. They were, they were treated like refuse. They were treated like a curse. If a parent's kids were looking toward them, they'd pull the kids to themselves. And every day of their life, they were humiliated. But it says here that, that the exalted God dwells. He's close. He's right there with this leper. Didn't realize it until he really connected with God in Jesus, but God says all the time, I dwell with one that is discouraged and humiliated. Why, God? Why do you do that? In order to cheer up the humiliated and to encourage the discouraged. Now, I don't know about you, but what little bit of humility that God has worked in me through the years, in my case anyway, maybe I'm just a tough, hard learner, it's come through me being humiliated, and I have set myself up to be humiliated numerous times but but thank god he's so gracious and so close at those times he takes that humiliation and instead of turning it into self-hatred it can turn into authentic humility and authentic humility is sanity it is seeing myself and god and life in a balanced perspective and knowing that i am utterly dependent upon god for everything even the next breath next brain wave and it puts me in a healthy state to start to grow the way that god always intended image-bearing beings to grow. Listen to this verse from Psalm 147, verse 3. It gives us more hope for the, the person that knows they are unhealthy. It says, he heals who? The brokenhearted. You can be sure this leopard was a brokenhearted, lonely, isolated person who felt lo- no love and disconnection. He heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds, healing their pain and comforting their sorrow. Now listen, nobody wants to have their heart broken. Anybody in this room and probably everybody in this room has had their heart broken. Anybody that has had their heart broken would rather almost experience physical pain of the worst sort than have their heart broken. But here's the thing I've learned by experience and I'll bet you a lot of you have too. When your heart is broken, there, there's, there's a new level of openness, spiritual openness in your spirit, in your soul that allows that, that energy, that agony. It just allows you to, to fuse with God if you'll move in that direction. If you go to him with your pain and your hopelessness and your heartbrokenness, it, 
it kind of shreds all the walls and all the defenses and all the coping mechanisms and all the masks that we wear. When you're brokenhearted, all that stuff goes away and you are just that. You are broken, utterly broken. And I have found it to be a very good place to be because you're never, it's never easier to connect with your creator than at those moments. You, you, you get this intuitive knowledge. This is what life is about. I now know what matters. I know what doesn't matter. And I know I know that life apart from a creator that cares and ultimately going to be help or it's going to ultimately going to help to restore things, there's no, there's no life to be had that's of any worth besides that. So a writer named Benet Brown, she's actually a professor of um, social work on a graduate level at University of Houston. Her name um, you might be familiar with because we've actually seen her in some of the leadership summits that we've had here. But... Um, she had a, a kind of a breakdown in her own life. She acknowledges this, midlife crisis, you could call it. And she wrote this. She said, uh, I definitely went back to church for all the wrong reasons. I really went because this is hard and this hurts and in all this midlife unraveling. Again, she went through a midlife crisis and a breakdown. I went back to church thinking that it would be like an epidural, like it would take away the pain. Then I discovered that faith and church was not like an epidural at all. It was like a midwife who just stood next to me and said, push, it's supposed to hurt. <laughs> I don't like pain of any kind. <laughs> you don't like pain of any kind. But you've probably learned like I've learned, there is some pain that's very beneficial ultimately. And brokenheartedness and being humiliated and feeling hopeless and feeling desperate and coming to the truth that we cannot cut it, we're unhealthy, we can't fix ourselves. Listen, there's no psychiatrist, there's no psychologist, there's no antipsychotic drug that you or I can take that can fix the deep, unhealthy problems that exist in our soul. They are the domain of our Creator, our Creator alone, and until we humbly reconnect with Him, and allow him to start doing his healthy healing work inside of us. There is no hope. The only thing those other things will do, and I'm not against psychiatry or, or psychology or, or antipsychotic drugs or anything, but I'm telling you that won't fix the ultimate problem, the deep problems inside. They might stabilize us, you know, and they might help us figure it out a little bit. But unless they ultimately bring us back to an intimate, desperate kind of a connection with our creator, the healing will be limited if there's healing at all. It's so another lady named, uh, if I get her on the screen there, Mary Carr, and she also wrote her memoirs about growing up in East Texas in the 60s, also came from a very dysfunctional family. But her quote here is interesting. She says, I don't think any of us get off this planet without suffering enormously. And one of the chief ways we suffer is by loving people who are incredibly what? Limited by the fact that they're human beings. <laughs> And they're going to disappoint us and break our hearts. We are all heartbroken. All. It's the, it's the human condition. I think that's true. You know what she's saying? She's saying there's something that drives us to want to be loved perfectly. We, we, we're looking for this elusive, perfect lover. This person that is absolutely, unconditionally, unselfishly devoted to us. They have so much strength and so much to give. They're always available. They can always deal with whatever it is we need, whenever we need it, all the time. And that person doesn't exist. Your husband can't do that, ladies. Your wife can't do that, men. I can't do that, congregation. That's the domain domain of our creator he's that elusive perfect lover who has unconditional love unlimited resources always available always cares always there and then those others that he puts into our life whether it be husbands wives family friends pastors whatever then the the love the limited love that they are able to give it becomes just sweeter because our deepest needs are met by the only one that can meet them. You've got to get this. Some of you, you're still angry at someone. Maybe your spouse or, or maybe your parents. I don't know. You're still angry. And it's making you unhealthy because you've been cheated. You've been deprived. Yes, you have. There you go. You feel better? <laughs> Guilty as charged, you know, whoever it is you're charging to meet all of your needs can't be done. Listen to me. Apart from Christ our creator... We're, we're, we're like fish out of water. We're, we're like a planet that's broken out of its orbit. We're like a Pandora's box that's been opened that nobody can close. We're like a puzzle that no one can solve. 
We're, we're like a bottomless pit of need that's been carefully decorated over so that nobody sees how deep our need really is. But you know how deep it is in your quiet moments, and I know how deep mine is, and I know that nobody but Christ himself can, can ever really bring the healing that my soul needs. I hope you know that. I hope you learn that. Life up to the point of meeting him. And then life after the point of meeting him. Jesus tells this guy, it's kind of interesting. He says, now whatever you do, don't tell anybody what I just did. Just go to the priest. Let the priest see that you no longer have leprosy so you can get back into the fellowship of God's people. But this guy, he can't help himself. How many of you are like that? If you, if you, if you see a good movie or if you find a good restaurant, you just can't wait to tell somebody. How, how many are, are that kind of person? Yeah, man, there's something in this. We like to share good news. Jesus actually tells this guy, don't do this. Said, yeah, see you, Lord. Hey, look what happened. Look, he, he did it. Look at me. You know, I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> but it's a wonderful thing. This guy who had lived with such a lack of constant confidence and self-loathing and fear and anxiety and brokenheartedness, He's buoyant, he's cheerful, he's confident. He now knows he finally has something to give. It is a wonderful thing in your life. Folks, and I'm not trying to stand up here saying that I'm perfectly healthy, far, far from it. I'm a work in progress. But I'm gonna tell you something I do know. It is a wonderful thing in life when you get to the point where God's love so fills you and you are so confident in him that every person you meet, you don't need anything from them. You really don't. You cherish whatever they give. But you don't need anything, and you walk through life with a confidence, I can serve you. I have something to give you, and I want to do that. I want to bless you. I want to give something to you. That is a different quality of life. That's the kind of life that Jesus himself has inside of him. He'll bring that kind of health inside of us so that we are givers and not takers. And it's a lot less vulnerable way to live. Listen to this verse from Isaiah 57, 18. This is the Lord speaking again. He says, hey, I've seen their behavior. He, he knows our deal. He knows the, the way we live. He says, I've seen their behavior, but I will heal them and give them rest. And I will once again console those who mourn. He did that for this leper. It goes on. I am the one who gives them reason to what? This leper man, he's out there telling everybody. He's got joy. He has something to give. Complete prosperity or success. This is an interesting term is available both to those who are far away and those who are nearby, says the Lord, and I will heal them. We have a counterfeit today that's being presented to us almost around the clock of what success and health is. This really struck me recently. I was watching an interview with John Goodman. He's a really good actor. You know, he did the old Roseanne, new Roseanne, and he's a brilliant actor. I like John Goodman as an actor. But I was watching this interview with him, and this thing really hit me with with crystal clarity, the, the counterfeit model of success and health that we have presented to us today. When you listen to the interview, he keeps, you know, talking about all his accomplishments and all like that, and he is quite accomplished, and it was clear that he was a very smart man, very educated. Obviously, he's got deep pockets. He's very wealthy, economically powerful. And this is the measure today of success. Are you educated and are you economically powerful? Can you live the right, the right, at the right standards? Are you, are you educated? Are you intelligent? That and you parents maybe are, are presenting this to your kids that all you want to see to it is they get a good education and they can take care of themselves and have a nice house, live in a nice neighborhood, drive a nice car. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but I'm telling you, if they, you think that's success, you have been deceived. Let me give you the model of health or, un, or, or what's health today. Health today, and John Goodman's uh, you know, dialogue presented this too, it's, it's self-awareness. As long as you're aware that you have flaws, as long as you are aware that you, you know, he talked about 30 years of alcoholism, but now he looks back and he realizes he had these ego problems, he had this, he had that, and, and he's talking about his awareness. Listen to me, listen to me. Where, awareness is good. Self-awareness is really good. It's the starting point of getting healthy. But do you think the leper was aware that he had leprosy? How many say, yeah, I think he knew he had leprosy, Randy? <laughs> Did that help anything? No. This is the lie that's being permeated and fostered upon us today is that self-awareness is equal to actual healing. It's not. It's not. So, Randy, what is the, the right model of success? Well, it's Jesus. 
Jesus is the right model of success. It is a human being who is living in total devotion to God and good, who lives to take all their time, talents, treasure, all their experiences, all their God-given gifts, everything, and devote them unselfishly to bless and build the kingdom of God and to bless and to build other human beings. I don't need anything. I'll give you what I can that, that Jesus is the picture of what real success is. It's not about education. It's not about economic power. What about health? Where do we get a picture of health? It's Jesus again. He's the only healthy human being that's ever been on the planet. He was the picture of health. What was he like? First of all, he was without sin. Why was he without sin? Because he was not driven by the forces that drive us. You and I are driven by, first of all, the fear of death. Therefore, self-preservation and the next default mechanism, self-gratification. In other words, I don't know how long I'm going to be alive. And so as long as I'm alive, I'm going to get as much pleasure as I can, any way I can, as long as I can. So I am driven, you are driven by self-preservation, self self-gratification, which makes us vulnerable to sin. We become sin factories, man, sin machines. And sin is not just God making up arbitrary rules and trying to spoil all our fun, take the joy out of our life. Quite the contrary. It's the designer saying the machine, humanity, can't function except one way, the way that the designer made it. Jesus is picture of health. And when Jesus, when you and I, like this leper, connect with Jesus, his life, his health starts to flow into us, and you absolutely will see a difference in somebody's life. It's not just self-awareness. It is actual transformation. The leper was cleansed. He was different. When you and I connect with Jesus on deeper levels. We're not only aware of how unhealthy we are, we start to actually get healthy. I'm not saying it's overnight. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying it's without bumps. But I'm telling you, it's real. And it's normal. It's what our creator wants to do for every human being on the planet. And it starts the minute that we do what this leper does. We just come humbly and desperately owning our dis-ease and letting God bring ease again into our souls. Listen to this verse from Jeremiah chapter 30. The Lord speaking says, yes, I will restore you to health. He actually will, not just awareness, real health. I will restore you to health. I will heal your wounds. I am the Lord, affirm it. You have been called an outcast. This leper was certainly called an outcast. And maybe you have felt all your life like you never quite fit in anywhere you, you, you've walked through life feeling like a leper. And God's saying, not so. You belong to me. You belong to all those that belong to him as well. And you just got to start letting God help you to see yourself the way he sees you. And Jesus, Jesus said in John 10, he said, far from him wanting to take the, the fun out of her life, take the spice out of her life. Far from that, he says, I came so that you could have life indeed so that, that they could live life to the what? to the fullest right here in this difficult, you know, sin-scarred world. He still wants us to have the best life possible. He says, I've said these things to you so that my joy will be in you and your joy will be what? And that joy, a lot of it is what I was talking about earlier, man. When you start actually seeing the health of Jesus come into you and it's who you are from the inside out and all you want to do is be a blessing to others, that creates a kind of a quality of interior life that keeps you in a stable, peaceful, restful, joyful state, even though you're going through all the ups and downs, weeping and mourning and celebrating and all the normal things of life, there's something deeper that brings this joy that Jesus was talking about. Now, I want to close with a kind of an uh, unusual illustration. It's um, based on an experiment that was done by a neurosurgeon named Lucy Brown. Uh, she she's works at Yeshiva University. And what she did was this. She wanted to gather some students who had recently had their hearts broken and ask them to bring the picture of the individual that broke their heart, and they were going to scan their brains and do, do some testing. And, and here's a quote from her. So the question the students were asked, have you been rejected in love, but you can't let go? You're still in that stage where you're, you're just still desperately clinging somehow. She goes on to say, it's not surprising that the same areas of the brain that were active in the brains of cocaine addicts were active in these people who were heartbroken looking at a picture of their former romantic partner. We crave the other person just as we crave nicotine or pain pills. You want to be near the other person. You're constantly thinking about them. We even do dangerous things sometimes to win them back. Now, you might be thinking, well, Randy, how does this all connect? Well, I think... 
the leper, on top of every other problem he had, he was desperately heartbroken and lonely. And he was seeking love, uh, an ultimate love, a stable love, an unconditional love, a love that would never, could never be scared away. And I think that many of us walk through this life unhealthy because we're heartbroken and we're still trying to find, listen to me carefully, because some of you are still, you're locked in this, you're still trying to find the answer in nouns. Yes, I said nouns, as in verbs and nouns, nouns. What do I mean? We're still trying to find the solution to our heartache in persons and places and things, that's, those are nouns. You know, I, I, I don't know, I'm just gonna move out of the area. If I move out of the area, everything will be done. I gotta get a new job, once I get the new job, we'll be good. I just need a new lover, need a new wife, need a new spouse, need a new, new husband. You know, we, we, we think that that's the solution. It's not. We have an existential ache in our soul for our creator, the perfect lover. Once we desperately and humbly reconnect with him, well, you're gonna find that you get a lot more objectivity and a lot more peace and you can love in a healthy way, not the black hole of emotional need that sucks the life out of everybody that gets too near you, but somebody that can give. That comes from having a fullness that only God can give. It's only Jesus that heals this guy's unhealthy condition, heartbroken condition, and my unhealthy condition, and your unhealthy condition, and each of our unique kinds of heartbreak that we all do carry. So I started this message with a question. I said, can you remember a time where you can now look back and you can see, man, oh, man, I was so unhealthy. I asked you a second question. I said, can you remember an experience in your life where you kind of sensed that you were unhealthy? You, you kind of knew something was wrong, but you didn't want to deal with it. You just want to put it off. You want to block it out of your mind. You want to blame other people, blame circumstances. Which, which of these might represent who you are, where you're at right now? And then the third, the third question was, have you experienced a time where you were so unhealthy you could no longer ignore it? The losses were too consistent. The consensus of people was impossible to drown out. People were avoiding you. People were bailing. People were abandoning you. You, you could no longer ignore how unhealthy you are, how toxic somehow you were. Couldn't sustain a relationship. Unattractive to relationships, whatever, whatever, the, whatever the symptom might be. You could no longer ignore it. Maybe that's who and where you're at today. The same, the same Savior that loved this guy in his brokenness, the condition that everybody else ran from him, Jesus ran toward him. He's here today. He's here. I know it. I've experienced his loving leadership and healing in my life for over 40 years. He is here for you. You've got to own your state, though. You've got to come like this, this leper came. No one that comes humble and sincere, broken and desperate, ever goes away dissatisfied. But you've got to come and I'm talking to Christians as well as those that are not because we don't get instantly healthy when we first become Christ followers. So let's pray and let's ask God to bring some light on us. Let's, let's do that. Father, you know us. You know that none of us yet bear the full health that you displayed, Lord Jesus, but we thank you for where you've brought us and we pray that you'll, you'll show us where we're at, that you'll help us to face what is true and to stop running and to allow uh, your powerful compassion to start a deeper healing process in our hearts, our souls, our minds, our lives, our spirits. We ask it all, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen.